town of Greenwich was shocked today as police arrived to investigate two grisly murders. They say the women's feet were sewn together at the bottoms of the corpses to look like mere images of each other. What about the water? Mr. Ensemble is the latest in a long list of murders perpetrated by the infamous serial killer known only as the Phantom Man. Mr. Ensemble is the latest in a long list of murders perpetrated by the infamous serial I no longer determine time by clocks or available light. My new world is now completely oriented by the comings and goings of a single sinister man. I don't know his real name, and I'm not sure knowing it would do me a bit of good anyway. I'm not even 100% the guy's even human. But he's definitely one of those neo-psychotics. Persons whose insanity has taken them almost completely out of the human category. And let me assure you, this fella is as far from your average Joe as it gets. Not to mention, he's also one of the nastiest serial killers you've likely never heard about. He assures me he's over 100 years old, and that he lived through the original Wastinghouse tragedy. By the way, he doesn't look a day over 35. He doesn't look much of anything, really. Just an ordinary guy. Maybe a tad on the thin side. Lean might be a better word for him, now that I think of it. He's got a predatory look to him. Now, while he looks innocuous enough, he completely switches gears when he's on the hunt. On those occasions, he wears a ragged moth-eaten suit, something you'd expect to find hanging off the bones of a late 18th century corpse. He also balances this shabby little stovetop pipe on his head, which adds about six inches or so to his height. He insists the entire outfit was made for him by a wildly talented tailor of yore and that it's held together by more than string and skill. To counterbalance the ragamuffin look of his clothing, he perches these tiny octagonal black-tinted eyeglasses on the very tip of his nose. Taken all together, he looks like something straight out of a goddamn nightmare, which is likely the vibe he's shooting for, I'm sure. Beyond all the oddities I already mentioned, he claims to have been called upon to play some sort of game. He generally refers to it as the Great Bloody Wolf Hunt, a slaughter sport that pits serial killers against one another. I've got to admit that's something I'd pay damn good money to watch, which is precisely where I come in. You see, Mr. Gray, that's what he calls himself, can no longer waste his mind and hands on the pedestrian or the wonderful craft of writing, as he must dedicate the sum of his dexterity and concentration to the Great Bloody Wolf Hunt. So, someone's got to keep his journals up to date. Lucky me. I won't bother giving you my name. Mr. Gray wouldn't have it anyway. Besides, I'm not much of anyone, really. Which, I'm sure, is part of the reason Mr. Gray nabbed me. There's no wife or kids to worry about me, no close friends to get concerned and go poking around. I'm just a chubby guy who writes books that very few people read. I'm not much of a novelist, but I have managed to get a few published, shitty though they are. Mostly I write short fiction. Bad short fiction. And I certainly regret writing the short story, Songs to Scream By. That's the one that caught Mr. Gray's eye. Shortly after abducting me, he explained I was the only writer he'd ever read who could, as he said, conjure the true failure of the spirit in its many and inevitable deaths. I took it as a compliment. I suppose. Anyway, Mr. Gray's been having me record his thoughts and exploits in this big, beautiful journal of his. Good Christ, the thing's even got handmade vellum pages. As a writer, I've got to award him some points for that. Up to the time he stole me away, he'd been keeping his own notes, and I was curious to know where he kept the other journals. Our conversations are generally pretty free-flowing and uh, personal, so I wasn't too frightened to ask. He actually seemed glad I'd taken an interest in him, and offered to take me to see the books, when time and circumstance allowed, of course. It wasn't long after when he whisked me off to a small farmhouse in the country, way back in the sticks. In the attic of a rickety old place, he showed me stacks and stacks of fancy journals, just like the one he gave me. Christ, there must have been hundreds of them. 
After thumbing through a bunch while he cheerfully looked on, I began to seriously consider what he'd said about his age. And that wasn't his only claim that began to wash with me. Now, God knows how many of what sort of people he's killed since I've known him, but I'm positive that at least some of them were, in fact, serial killers. One of the heads he brought home was a dead ringer, pun intended, of the killer called Quiet Quentin, a little person. Not long after that, he brought home the mostly intact corpse of Paul Stillwater, the Gobstown Goblin. I'm absolutely convinced it was the goblin, as the cops later found and identified the carcass we left behind. There are a few more noteworthy stiffs, but I'll not get into those just yet. For now, I just want to assure you that some of his body count really did come from genuine, honest-to-goodness killers. As for his motive for killing, I have no idea what the hell drives him. No idea, that is, save for the insane gibberish that he let slip from time to time. He appears to believe that killing is his job, his duty more like, handed down to him from way back, something like 150 years ago, by some anomalous force he's yet to properly comprehend. He says he must kill and dismember so as to, quote, empower the next tides of change, and that he's got to, quote again, fill the pot with broth which others are responsible for stirring and cooking. I don't exactly know what all that means, but I have a feeling he's talking about bringing about a second great darkness. I don't have to tell you, dear reader, that the very idea of wanting to kick off another darkness is flatly insane. Well, I'd better close up shop for the night. I can hear him climbing the stairs outside. He's likely dragging a body with him. That's been his routine for the last few months, whenever he comes home this late. It's likely the corpse of one of his great bloody wolves. Well, that sure was a long session. Generally, he's a bit more circumspect about his nighttime dalliances with death, preferring to let the reader fill in some of the blanks. Not tonight, though. I haven't really seen him like that before. It seems like Mr. Gray has been getting these strange dreams about his fellow killers, or wolves, as he oft calls them. You see, he believes all the killers in the Great Bloody Wolf Hunt share a single, if highly compartmentalized, dream. Initially, the dreams were just so much red static, but as the number of players lessened with each kill, the dream became more coherent. Eventually, the dream allowed for the remaining killers to not only communicate with each other while they slept, but even, if they had a mind to, mosey into one another's dreams. Recently, there's been some drastic changes to the game, apparently. Specifically, a major player just got himself clipped. But not by another player, by a, and I'm quoting again, creature who abides the spaces beyond the game, within a white wasteland of plastic bones and solid souls. Yet again, his word is not mine. He's got a penchant for the dramatic, I'm sure you can tell. Worse still, this outsider has begun murdering all of the other murderers. All of this was the gist of Mr. Gray's most recent dream. Oh, and it was indeed a body my captor was dragging behind him when last I wrote. You might recall that shitbird a few years back who filled up his victims' emptied corpses with the ashes of cremated children. Well, it was that guy. Gordon Flint was his name. At least, that's what his driver's license said. After Mr. Gray took what he wanted from the body, more on that in just a bit, we left the ruined thing behind, bobbing in the Arkansas mud. As I said, the corpse has since been identified by the police, so there's your proof in the pudding, so to speak. But Gordon didn't feature too largely in tonight's debriefing, so it's best I move on. The most important part of tonight's transcription was that at some point during Mr. Gray's clash with Flint, something showed up and interrupted the showdown. A monstrous creature, he said. A thing that had the appearance of borrowing from hell its least attractive characteristics. The monster's presence apparently forced the two adversaries into an awkward alliance, to fight it off so that they could get back to fighting one another. 
Unfortunately for Mr. Flint, the creature proved too much for even their combined strength, and Mr. Gray ended up dragging what was left of him back to the house. Now, as for Mr. Gray's performance in the brawl, I can only assume it was good enough for him to get the hell out of Dodge while the getting was good. Though I have to admit, it's a little hard to think of my abductor as an underdog in any fight. Now, on more than one occasion, I have seen hints of what Mr. Gray gets up to when he's on the hunt, and I can tell you it's some dark and dangerous business indeed. One horrible rainy night, while we were hiding out in an old abandoned candy factory, I got to see one of my keeper's infamous wolves up close and far too personally. This gentleman seemed to melt out of the shadows, dripping with all of these clinking hooks and chains, and wearing the most bizarre mask you can imagine. At least I'm hoping it was a mask. Before I knew it, the thing had spread out these chains all across the ceiling and walls like some great big damned spider. He sprang into the middle of the web and crouched down into the darkness of the room. What I hadn't noticed was that I'd been attached to the web by means of a hook that had slid through the palm of my hand. I didn't even feel it. Mr. Gray later told me that the killer laced his hooks with some kind of chemical agent that dulled the nerve endings so the victims wouldn't know they'd been snagged. Anyway, I started to scream, of course, which I suppose was the point, to lure Mr. Gray into the trap. My kidnapper, whether or not he's a century old, is an uncommonly wise fellow, and had already prepared for the killer. I was the bait, you see, to lure the killer into thinking I'd be good bait for luring Mr. Gray, if you can follow all of that. Mind you, before that point, I'd never seen my captor participate in the Great Bloody Wolf Hunt, and I was a little worried about his chances against the webcasting freak. I had nothing to fear, it turns out. Mr. Gray dealt with the other killer handily, jumping onto the chain-link web and, like some berserker gymnast, kicking and slashing his way to a gory victory. I only mention all this to introduce you, dear reader, to another one of Mr. Gray's weird claims. His kill list. You see, apparently, every killer in the Great Bloody Wolf Hunt is given an old yellowed list. How they come by them, I have no idea, on which is printed the names of the killers they are responsible for murdering. I know this because after the chain and hook individual was dead, Mr. Gray slid a piece of paper out from the corpse's inside pocket. Then, while he perused the names on the paper, he explained to me exactly what he was doing. He said, Every list marks a wolf by his God-given name, which I use to track my prey. And every wolf I bring to ground, their names I shall inherit. Until no wolves are left, and the dire shepherd stands before me, bearing a red prize. And that's just what he did. Copied the names from the other killer's list onto his own. That's how I know the real names of the killers he dispatches. His kill list. All of this comes to bear in my most recent conversation with Mr. Gray. Apparently, while he and Mr. Flint were battling the creature, Mr. Gray caught sight of a piece of paper tucked into the beast's back pocket. After some fancy and violent finagling, my captor managed to grab hold of it, scanning it for a brief second before the creature snatched it back. My kidnapper then informed me that it was a complete list from A to Z of every wolf left in the game written in the rigid script of a corpse, the neatest of lines crossing out the names of the dead. Among the other unusual features of the monster's kill list, there lurked a stark departure from any murderer's catalog he'd ever seen before. There was one name which wasn't crossed off, but only had a question mark next to it. He only glimpsed the first name. It said, Donald 